Welcome. My name is Terry Lalane. I'm the Deputy Director in the Division of Systems Analysis in the Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research here at the NRC and your session chair for Am I a Robot? How Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning are Impacting the NRC and Nuclear Industry. Next slide, please. AI is one of the fastest growing technologies globally and is the next frontier of technological adoption in many industries, including the nuclear industry. As a modern risk-informed regulator, we must keep pace with technological innovations while ensuring the safe and secure use of AI in nuclear facilities. Our expert panel today brings a range of AI perspectives and experience from domestic to international in the nuclear industry, our federal partners and their approaches to similar questions regarding AI and the NRC's current activities. Following the briefings, we'll have an open discussion and audience question and answer period. So please be sure to submit your questions throughout the session. Next slide, please. It's my pleasure to introduce our panel today. So welcome to Mr. Gene Kelly, Senior Manager at Constellation Generation. Mr. Kelly has over 40 years of experience in the nuclear industry, including design, analysis, and licensing. He's a Senior Manager in Risk Management for Constellation Generation, responsible for risk-informed initiatives across the Constellation fleet. He was also the technical lead responsible for relicensing of the Limerick Nuclear Station, managed engineering programs and designs at Limerick, and worked previously with the NRC as a branch chief and a senior resident inspector. Mr. Kelly holds a bachelor's degree in physics from Villanova and a master's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome to Ms. Aline Beclaw. She has been recently appointed as the division director of nuclear power in the Department of Nuclear Energy of the IAEA. Ms. Dekla has a extensive experience as a program director of several new build projects. She managed large investments projects for conversion and enrichment for facilities such as Flamenville 3 EPR and a portfolio of nuclear civil and equipment activities, including SMR development. She is also engaged in gender balance and diversity actions, notably president of WIN, Women in Nuclear for France, and is an active member of WIN Global. Ms. Declau holds a master's degree in science and engineering technology from Ecola Polytechnique, a master's degree in civil engineering technology from the Ecola de Ponce Chousses, and an MBA from College de Engineers. Welcome, Mr. Ben Schumeg. Mr. Schumeg is the software quality lead in the Quality Engineering and System Assurances Directorate of the U.S. Army Futures Command DevCom Armament Center in the U.S. Department of the Army. He leads research in test and evaluation and verification and validation capabilities for artificial intelligence, machine learning, automation, and other technologies, and assisting the Quality Engineering and System Assurance Directorate in developing policies and procedures to be used by the Armament Center. He currently leads the Army AI Software sub Safety Subgroup, focused on the test and evaluation and verification and validation of AI systems and data. Mr. Schumek also spent a year with the Safety and Mission Assurance Office at NASA's Johnson Space Center, assisting in software quality assurance for commercial visiting vehicles to the International Space Station. He holds a bachelor's degree in computer engineering from the Pennsylvania State University, and his master's degree in computer engineering from the Stevens Institute of Technology. And welcome to Mr. Luis Benacourt, the chief of the accident analysis branch in the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission's Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research. Mr. Benacourt leads highly skilled data scientists in developing the NRC's artificial intelligence AI strategic plan to enable the safe and secure use of AI in nuclear facilities and accelerate AI utilization across the NRC. Mr. Benacourt joined the NRC in 2008 as a digital instrumentation and controls engineer in research. Since that time, he's held several positions from the technical assistant for NRR, acting chief of the instrumentation controls and electronics engineering branch, an instrumentation and controls engineer, and a new reactor project manager. Throughout his career, he's been a key proponent 
of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education, and continues to volunteer and represent the agency in multiple annual youth outreach events in the Washington, D.C. area. Before joining the NRC, he worked as a control engineer for GE Aviation and a new projects engineer at Stryker Endoscopy. Mr. Benacourt has a BS in electrical engineering from the University of Puerto Rico, a professional certificate in public sector leadership from Cornell University. He's a senior member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers and a registered professional engineer in the state of Maryland. With that, I welcome all of our presenters. And now we'll start our briefings with Mr. Gene Kelly's presentation, Stay in Your Lane, Dude. Thank you, Terry. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. And I'm, I'm very honored to be on this panel with a, a very uh, excellent group of panelists and experts here in the area. And uh, you know what I'm hoping to share with you today, as uh, we put the slides up, is um, you know some of the lessons learned that we've we've garnered here at Exxon or at Constellation Energy now. Uh, you know, as we've deployed some of these uh, new technologies and in artificial intelligence, and and we're going to share those lessons learned with you here. Uh, next slide, please. Now you're probably wondering uh, why I've used and chosen this uh, picture. And it, it turned out I was watching one of my favorite movies, The Big Lebowski with Jeff Bridges and John Goodman and Steve Buscemi. And, uh, you know, happened to be talking to one of our project uh, experts in Leeds and he had been driving home in, in, in his new car and, and it was a very difficult um, uh, trip up uh, I-95 and it was raining very heavily. He couldn't see well. And he said that the, uh, you know, the technology in the car now um, enabled him to stay in the lane, even though he could hardly see the road. And, and it occurred to me that, uh, you know, in, 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 in the theme of this conference that uh, there's concern sometimes that we go to full autonomy with artificial intelligence and machine learning. But the reality is when you look at automotive applications, there's various levels of autonomy. And we're, we're far from a, a, a totally autonomous vehicle. And, and, and basically the, uh, the applications we've developed thus far at, at Constellation are really intended to uh, keep the users fully engaged and in essence, keep them in their lane so they can focus on what's important. And uh, you know, we're, gonna, we're gonna walk you through some of the examples here in the subsequent slides. So uh, that's really the reason for the, uh, the humor and, and the big Lebowski. Next slide, please. Now this slide is, is pretty interesting and it's sequences. So I'm gonna ask you to uh, bump it a, a little bit, but you know, we started out this way with what you see uh, with the initial ideas of here's what we're gonna do. And we were gonna go in and automate certain aspects of our corrective action process and our work control process. And then we sat down and engaged the end users. And you know, that's really our first and maybe most important lesson is you, you really find out what the problem you're going to solve when, when you sit down and engage the end users. And there's, there's just no substitute for doing this due diligence. It's, it takes some time, it takes some effort, but it's worth its weight in gold because it really tells you what the problem you really need to solve. So if you hit the next button, what you'll see is once we sat down with them, um, just click on that slide, uh, we found out that there were other things that they wanted to add. And, and that's when we started to understand uh, what we could really do for them to, to really kind of reduce the effort and, and really help them in doing their job every day. So if you hit the button again, uh, you'll see this slide kind of fills in as we started to learn more on the left-hand side about you know, what we were gonna do with our corrective action screening and prioritization. And if you hit the button again on the right, uh, we sat down with work week managers and what we call cycle managers. You, you can hit it again there. And you can see that we, we eventually filled in the blanks of all the things we want to do. And, you know, we ended up uh, really designing um, 11 different algorithms and models. But this is worth its weight in gold because this is where we really uh, honed in on, on where the savings are going to be. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Many times people will ask, you know, well, why cap data, corrective action process data? And, and I mean, it's, first of all, it's a big data source, right? We, we all in, in the nuclear industry, we generate a, a number of condition reports every year on the order of, you know, five, 6,000 per site. And uh, it's a big data source, right? It's, it's also an important cornerstone of the NRC's 
reactor oversight process. And, and, and the way I would term it is that just about everything that happens at a plant that's important is reflected in that cap data. And, and uh, but, but you can see from the statistics that we have a scheme for both significance and severity and, and type. And, um, you know, there, there's thankfully very few, very significant things that happen that require extensive investigations. And the vast majority of the data, almost 99% of it is, is, is low level significant. And, and, and really the message on this slide is that our algorithms and what we're doing to automate aspects of the process is gonna allow us to focus on the really important uh, conditions, which is where we think our uh, uh, you know, focus should be. Next slide, please. Uh, I bring this up uh, just because this is an application we've already had in place. This has been very successful. We've had it in place two years now at Constellation. It's, it's, it's used for our maintenance rule process and, and we've been able to automatically identify uh, uh, potential maintenance rule functional failures. Uh, the, the users have provided excellent feedback. And I, I think it's worth pointing out in that second bullet that the software really isn't making the failure determination, right? All it's doing is flagging those condition reports that are worthy of human review. So, you know, the, the message here is that the end user is still fully engaged. And even more so, they're, they're backstop, fully backstop, because our system engineers and strategic engineers still monitor the day-to-day -day traffic in that system for their systems and the components in those systems. And so, you know, this is, this is fully backstopped such that, you know, you're not just totally relying on a, a software. And, and, you know, we've gained confidence with this over two years uh, through the continuous feedback from the users. Uh, and lastly, I would just point out that we've biased the software in a way that's uh, more, more focused on uh, high safety significant component fares so that we have very uh, few, if any, miss rates. In fact, our miss rate has been zero for two years. So we think this has been very successful. Uh, and, it's, it's, and, and the key is we've now built subsequent applications based on this first successful one. Uh, next slide, please. This slide probably bears some real close looking. And I guess if I were to pick one slide that was the most important in the whole presentation, this is it. Because this is the graphical user interface. This is what the end user sees as a result of the algorithm that we built. And, and it's, it's really awesome. I, I don't have the time here to explain all the details, but it's really showing you the confidence values and why certain condition reports are flagged. It, it has textual comments to provide the context on how the decisions reached. It shows you what's called the word grams, which is how the artificial neural networks are built. And, and finally, uh, you know, you have to revisit this. You can't just walk away from it after you build it because you may have procedure or rule changes in your process. You, your, your, your performance data may change the plant. And uh, you know, so it's really uh, important here that humans continue to validate the model's predictions. And, and again, the, the, the time with the end users is very well spent to develop that graphical user interface. Next slide, please. Just a few words here about, you know, every, anybody who's in any of these innovations knows you have to make the business case. Uh, I would point out that our, our, our industry has many processes, so there's, there's lots of opportunities there to apply these technologies in these processes. And, and you know, we, we, we see that we can improve data quality, we can improve our, our organizational decision-making, and, and, and also employee bandwidth. I think one of the commissioners talked about that this morning, but, you know, particularly for us as a new company who's just split and we're getting into new areas, uh, you know, you, you want to be able to... Uh, uh, deploy your, your, your resources and your people, you know, where the new priorities and work is. So this is really going to give us the opportunity to do that. Maybe probably one of the most important bullets here is that this is an opportunity for us to eliminate low value work. Uh, we talk about that a lot in our workplaces. It's easy to say, it's hard to do, and it's hard to let go, but this has really given us uh, a, a golden opportunity to evaluate, uh, eliminate low value work. Uh, next slide, please. And I should say, as, as we go to the, uh, the next one here, that um, you know, the, the key message from that last slide is that it's, it's, it's really helping us to focus on what's important. And, and if there's any one theme throughout this whole preso, that's the one I would uh, continue to reemphasize is, 
is that this technology is helping us to focus on what's really important. Uh, we, we have worked and collaborated with the Department of Energy and Idaho National Labs. And, and uh, what we're finding, and, and it was a surprise to me, I'm not a data scientist, but there, there are a variety of methods and all sorts of approaches and hybrid approaches, supervised, unsupervised. And, and what we're finding is literally what the slide says that you know one size doesn't fit all. And, and um, you know, I, I love this quote from the article. I've, I've read a lot here in, in the journey over the last year or so, but uh, you know, it, it really the algorithms you're gonna pick and the techniques you're gonna pick are gonna depend upon the kind of data you're working with and the problem you wanna solve and you know, what you wanna get to. So the bottom line is when you get into another lesson learned we've had is as you get into these, you'll find that there's many ways to do this that, and uh, it's not just one or two approaches. Uh, so uh, interesting uh, lesson we've learned here uh, thus far. Next slide, please. So finally, you know, where are we headed? Um, you know, and I guess I would point out that with each successive application we've done, we've learned a little more and we've built upon it. So that first one with maintenance for functional failure has been pretty successful. And, and, and we're gonna build on that with the next two. We're gonna start the pilots for the corrective action and the new work screening here uh, later this month. And then we're gonna set our sights on some other processes. And like I say, there's, there's a lot of processes that you can uh, aim this at. Uh, but one of the biggest challenges when you read the literature is that uh, integrating this into your, uh, your systems and your, your processes is probably one of the biggest challenges. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're gonna continue to look at additional areas. We have a lot of good ideas on where we can apply it, but we start first with small things and then work up from there. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, I guess I'd end today with, uh, you know, sharing with you, this is a feeling that's been with me the whole time I've been involved with this for the better part of a year or so. And that is uh, when I think about artificial intelligence and machine learning, it's, it's really not a matter of if, it's only when I think that we're all gonna be there. And, and, you know, the picture here, of course, is to say that, you know, it's probably only a matter of if when we're going to be driving autonomous vehicles as well, you know, and, but, but I, I really do think that uh, this technology allows us to really focus on what's important. And, and boy, that's just so valuable in our business for safety. Uh, and, and the second bullet is very fascinating to me, but you know, a lot of us in, in our companies uh, struggle or have the challenge of, you know, knowledge retention and, and, and retaining tribal knowledge as, as people leave and retire and, 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 and new, new people come in. And, you know, the, the use of this it gives you a, a solution, I think, in that regard, and that you can continue to make this algorithm smart and, and it retains the wisdom. And so, you know, perhaps there's a solution there for all of us on, um, you know, how to, you know, solve the knowledge retention issues as well in, in various processes. And, and again, you know, there's probably the, the opportunity here for a very powerful industry outcome. And as, as uh, one of the uh, DOE uh, directors, uh, Dr. Curtis Smith has said to me, uh, and I think he aptly described AI and ML, it's, it's the new math. So, uh, you know, with that, I think I'll stop and uh, thank you, Terry, I'm, I'm done my presentation. All right, thank you, Jane. Our next panelist is Ms. Elaine Desclos with the presentation, AI for Nuclear Energy. Okay, thank you, Terry. So do you see my presentation? Yeah. So I am very honored to be part of this panel today. Uh, I am director of the Division of Nuclear Power in the IAEA, Department of Nuclear Energy. And it's really in our mission in the agency to share the knowledge among all our member states about new technologies, to enable the uh, development of these technologies, to define the necessary condition, and artificial intelligence is really part of uh, our task. So I will, next slide please, yes. So I will tell you where we are today because it's a quite a long journey. Uh, well, this slide shows you in a broad view what is artificial intelligence in a common language. So it's leveraged computers and machines to mimic problem solving and decision making capabilities of human mind as a general topic. And so where can we apply this in the nuclear industry? In several fields, as you can see on this slide. So regarding machine learning and deep learning, which is uh, on the left 
uh, top part of the slide. Um, we can support predictive analysis. For example, on nuclear power plants, we can use that to improve modeling and simulation capabilities, as well as enhance performance of digital twins with, by adding simulation tools to these uh, twins. Another part is uh, natural language processing, which is a branch that enables machines to understand human language. We can do that in the support of classification, translation, and data extraction. For example, we can use it in analysis nuclear power specific requirements. It's a um, field where uh, quality assurance uh, can benefit. Uh, for example, by ensuring the product or service is meeting the specified requirements through techniques of natural language processing. Another field is uh, expert system. It emulates decision-making ability of human experts. It can be used for knowledge representation, for generation of models, for processing of models, particularly for diagnosis. And this have, can, can have wide application to nuclear safety. Um, if we go to uh, technologies like computer vision, it's also, uh, there are also uh, quite interesting technologies uh, to uh, take meaningful information from digital image. We all have in mind uh, the image coming from regular inspection and destructive inspection, for example. And it can provide insight that would be uh, missed by human manual analysis only. Automation, it's not really, and robotics, it's not really a new technology. However, these techniques can be really enhanced by artificial intelligence, for example, by using computer vision technologies. Uh, and um, last but not least, all these based algorithms could potentially also be used for design and optimization of uh, nuclear reactor cores designs. So this is quite a broad view. Next slide. And um, now I will go a little bit deeper in what we do uh, in uh, the IAEA. So next slide. So we have had several uh, technical meetings, uh, working groups and technical meetings. And this slide shows you where we are, what is the state of the art uh, in the AI, where it is applied. And this is already uh, taken from a uh, return of experience uh, of our um, experts participating in these technical meetings. So as I've said, well, one of the first uh, quite obvious field is automation because it can automation, automotive, uh, automated process can reduce uh, really the human factor in, uh, um, in the work activity, nuclear activities. It increases reliability, it reduces time also uh, of uh, operation. In um, it, optimization also is um, a part where we can uh, optimize complex, proce complex processes, uh, like, for example, uh, plan of strat and strategies for inventory management, outage scheduling, fuel cycle parameters. So it can help to process a lot of data. Um, it's also in use in building information modeling and also for verification and val validation. Another part, another field where uh, we also see uh, many applications is analytics, also for model validation, for advanced computer simulation. And as I said uh, in the, at the beginning, it's of use in digital twin application. And um, another uh, part is prediction prognosis, prognosis uh, by looking at uh, events we can reduce failure or at least detect uh, uh, failure in advance, uh, assess current asset conditions, and uh, for example, remaining use useful life of components. And uh, all these uh, insights uh, will help to extract and fuse uh, and um, use data from multiple knowledge sources and that are collected from thousands of years of operating experience, massive libraries of scientific benchmark and validation experiments. 
So all these uh, techniques are used are uh, now more and more commonly deployed. However, next slide, please. Uh, we know all that there are deployment challenges, and this is, I think, today's uh, topic. First of all, because uh, this uh, data can be, uh, or the result of uh, AI can be interpretable. Uh, we don't, there is a question of trust, of robustness, uh, of uh, the performance of AI. Um, we cannot use the traditional uh, verification and validation approaches uh, for AI because it's uh, quite limited transparency. And um, the high level regulatory safety assessment principle and guidance may need to be developed. It's not yet uh, really recognized uh, worldwide. And of course, uh, all the security, cyber security, uh, issues with data, with uh, adversarial attacks uh, are there, uh, are already there, but uh, we also have an increased risk of cybersecurity by using uh, artificial intelligence and uh, like, um, well, also due to the limited transparency of uh, what's in the uh, machine learning uh, tools. So what's next? Uh, can you change, please, the slide? Yes. So we have we work on different aspects. First, on uh, less mature technology, what that's what we call technology development. Uh, and so we need further development of technology before uh, applying that uh, on nuclear power plants. That's uh, our view, at least. Um, we have also categorized some technology with which you call which are in a deployment uh, stage. Uh, for example, all this automated analysis of non-destructive examination. Uh, it's almost uh, it's, I think it's more and more uh, commonly used. Uh, or um, all what is about predictive maintenance procedure. And then there is a field also where we work. It's technology enabling. So, of course, by developing legal regulation for this application, by developing common requirement database and common requirements that are understandable by AI uh, for use of optimization, simplification, and specification, because it's not uh, today the, the requirements, how they are written, and it's uh, dependent on uh, the, the user, mainly, uh, and the operator. And uh, we also have to develop algorithms that are accessible, so give more transparency to the alg algorithm and understandable to uh, artificial intelligence. Next slide, next uh, two slides. Yeah, so what we do, uh, for example, for activities. So last year we had a big uh, technical meeting on artificial intelligence for nuclear. So you can see that there are many fields. Uh, it's not only nuclear power but it's also related to ethics, food and agriculture, health and nuclear and physics. Next slide. We are also part of the International Telecommunication Union of the United Nations. And uh, we participate in webinars like this one was AI for good or AI for atoms. And next slide, please. And Every year, uh, there is a publication from uh, the ITU, not specific only to nuclear, but there we uh, have um, quite a few numbers of examples and we share the development of AI for nuclear technology and application. Uh, so it's also accessible uh, on the internet side. And uh, before finishing, I would like also to mention uh, one point that for me, it's very important, especially in this uh, day of uh, women's uh, in the international day, is that it relates also to ethics, uh, is that there are a lot of, uh, well, the developers are mainly uh, men, for, uh, I can say, and uh, in uh, computer and IT science, uh, we are lacking of women. So if we could do all everything to attract women, that would be very good because I think that diversity in uh, developing algorithm, in uh, uh, yes, looking at the requirements is very important uh, to 
have something which is very close to human brain and uh, to have the, all the diversity. Um, and I would like uh, Terry to offer you this uh, because the, the question is, am I a robot? So definitely, I don't know if I am a robot, but if I would be one, I would choose this image with a nice picture. And I think that we should share this to attract more young girls into uh, our domain. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, reminder, you can submit your questions um, for our Q&A session. So if you have any questions for our speakers, please make sure to submit those. Our next panelist is Mr. Benjamin Schumed with the presentation, U.S. Army Combat Capabilities Development Command Armament Center. Over to you, Ben. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Dr. Lane mentioned, my name is Ben Schumed. I'm representing the AFC uh, Armament Center, DEVCOM Armament Center, uh, specifically our Quality Engineering and System Assurance Group. Um, so also thank you for having me today. Uh, I know I'm, maybe I'll say the slight oddball in the group here um, as I'm more from the DOD, but hopefully kind of going through this presentation, I can uh, give you an idea as to why we kind of feel that it's important that we kind of talk together and work together on some of these challenges with artificial intelligence. Uh, especially when it comes to the safety of those systems. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this first slide um, kind of talks a little bit about uh, some of the reasons why uh, the DOD specifically has been very kind of aware and tracking what's going on with artificial intelligence and especially some of those challenges. Uh, probably the biggest thing that came out was the NSCAI or the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence which was, I believe, a congressional-led and congressional-funded uh, research into what artificial intelligence means, not only for the DOD, but of course, for the federal government. And that report really pointed out many key areas that need to be followed. Uh, and I kind of highlighted a couple here that really impact uh, myself as part of our quality engineering group, uh, thinking about data science, verification validation, reliability, safety, and of course, human system integration. Uh, a lot of these other reports that you can see on the screen uh, also talk to these very same aspects, uh, especially safety, you know, one of the reasons I'm here today. Uh, and I wanted to point out that last one on that bottom right, a little hard to see, but that is the uh, responsible AI memo that was uh, released by the Honorable Secretary Hicks uh, concerning how we are going to ensure that the systems that are developed by the DOD maintain those five ethical principles. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just kind of a little bit about uh, why I'm here and who I am. Uh, so Armament Center uh, is the primary, uh, I'll say, development organization, development command that's looking at uh, conventional weapon systems and ammunition for the Army. Uh, so it's, you know, as with any kind of system and new novel technology, there are ways that this could revolutionize the way, you know, AI and ML could revolutionize the way that these technologies are being developed by Armament Center. Uh, but of course, you know, that brings challenges and that brings things that we want to ensure that we're looking at. Uh, so some of these challenges, of course, you know, we're, we're looking at what does it mean for continuous learning? What does it mean for these very complex statistical algorithms that are going to be used? And how are we going to ensure configuration management? Uh, what kind of new methods or, or procedures or processes are going to have to implement to make sure that we can uh, assure, and I'll talk about that in a second, uh, assure that what we are developing meets the intent and the needs of what we are developing it for. Uh, making sure to look at different sensors, different inputs, and how this data, as you know, you'll see data is very critical from a machine learning perspective. Um, how can we assure that it is uh, unbiased, that it's correct, that it's accurate, that it meets the context of the environment that it's being used in, and still maintaining uh, these reliable, ethical, safe, and robust capabilities of this system. Uh, so what the Armament Center did is we looked at what's called the Armament Material Release Process, which is the final gate that a system must go through before it can be deployed and be utilized out in the field. Uh, next slide. And so I'll kind of briefly just talk about that for just a second. Uh, we want to ensure that anything that's released by the DOD uh, meets these, what we call the three S's, safe, suitable, and supportable. Uh, I won't go to each question here, uh, but as you can imagine safety being one of our top priorities. So we have a lot of things and a lot of um, stakeholders 
and a lot of different uh, milestones, documentation, deliverables, things like that that have to be met. Um, and those are listed on the left side. Uh, suitable, you know, is it the right system? Was it developed correctly? Does it meet verification requirements? Does it meet validation requirements? So we have a lot of independent testing that takes place, a lot of safety assessments that will take place to make sure that that system meets that suitability requirement. And lastly, supportability. Can this system be uh, supported in the field? Do we have the right logistics in place? Uh, do we have the right um, fielding plans and the right training for any sort of operators of any of our systems? Uh, so this applies to any system, you know, any system that's being released by the Army that will go through our office. It must meet all of these uh, requirements before it can be, as we say, kind of put in the hands of, of a soldier. Next slide, please. Uh, so I wanted to touch just briefly on one of those aspects. You know, we're, we're working a lot of different things, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, but I wanted to touch on safety because I feel that that's probably where we'll have a lot of cross collaboration and a lot of good technical cross discussions with the NRC and their partners. Uh, so I think it goes without saying that the safety challenges are significant when you're thinking in AI and ML systems. There's a lot of complexity to that design. You know, there could be changing and uh, differing and off nominal environments. How we're looking at the uh, cognitive interaction of the human in that loop of the system and what kind of perceptions are they going to have about uh, different behavior or unexpected, possibly unexpected then behavior of that system. And so looking at what do our levels of rigor uh, when we look at different software intensive systems need to be changed. Uh, so some of those things that we're looking at, uh, looking at different safety methodologies, different safety precepts looking at ways to uh, adjust or recommend new ways to do a functional hazard analysis, uh, general safety requirements, what artifacts might need to be needed, and sort of identifying AI safety critical functions and any of that data that leads to that function, be it as part of design or as part of uh, what we call inference when the actual model is active. Uh, of course, understanding the concept of operations, what are environments, uh, understanding those enabling technologies and what kind of autonomy may or may not be involved in that system. Taking all of that in and thinking about what kind of levels of rigor must take place, what kind of metrics and measures must be developed and what artifacts can be delivered. Uh, lastly, looking at both the hazard mitigation guidance as well as any sort of adjustments to kind of our safety uh, risk assessment approaches for AIs the different levels of autonomy, LORs, kind of summarizing it into what we believe would be good practices, possible regulations, or policy changes. Uh, and that's why I have that little blurb there about mill standard 882 ECHO. Uh, that is our safety standard that we follow within the Army, which is undergoing a revision, and we plan to submit a lot of uh, suggested changes and, and working with that group to make sure that any of the needs that come from AI and ML technologies are appropriately included in that. Next slide. And I believe this is my last slide. Uh, so, you know, I just touched on that one point about safety, uh, but we're looking at a lot of different things at Armament Center. Uh, we're reviewing a lot of the policies and identifying the gaps in those policies. You know, we have many, many Army regulations, DOD directives, DOD instructions. So kind of doing our analysis of that to see where we are and where we think there could be uh, better, you know, things made better and better improvements. Looking at data science, you know, with, as I kind of said already, AI and ML is, or ML specifically, is very critical of data science and making sure you have the right data and making sure you analyze that data and understand that data as it will be developing that system for you. Verification and validation, of course, it goes without saying, very important and very critical part of any system development. Uh, so we want to ensure that whatever methods that might need to be uh, adjusted or created or developed or collaborated with developing organizations is done as well. Uh, safety, you know, I spoke to that already a little bit, but again, you know, trying to ensure that these systems that are developed are still safe and remain um, appropriate for their use. Material release, that is kind of, as I mentioned, our final gate uh, where we're kind of culminating a lot of these data points that you just saw into that material release that can be reviewed by stakeholders and by all these different um, panelists, very similar to today, uh, to ensure that that system is good to go for deployment. And lastly, it kind of brings us to trust. You know, we want to have that trust and what we're kind of calling assured trust in that system, not over-trusting and not under-trusting, but finding that right level of trust through things like human system integration, 
uh, what we call soldier touch points and things like that to make sure that that system is going to be used uh, the way that it was intended to be used and that the soldier or operator uh, trusts it and will abide by what they need to do to utilize it. And I believe that was my last slide. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Ben. Our next panelist is Mr. Luis Benecourt with the presentation, Increasing NRC Readiness and Artificial Intelligence Decision-Making. Over to you, Luis. Thank you, Dr. Lalein. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. As Dr. Lalein said, my name is Luis Betancourt, and I am the Branch of Champion for Artificial Intelligence. I am pleased to be here today to discuss what are we doing as an agency to increase our readiness in evaluating uh, AI technologies. Uh, next slide, please. So as Dr. Lalein mentioned in her opening remarks, AI is actually one of the fastest growing technologies globally, and it's actually the next frontier of technological adoption for the nuclear industry. It has the potential to transform the industry by providing new and vital insights into vast amounts of data generated during the design and operation of a nuclear facility. And it offers new opportunities to potentially enhance safety and security, improve operational performance, and potentially implement autonomous control and operation. And as a result, we have been seeing that the industry is researching and using AI applications to meet future energy de uh, demands. It is critical for us as an agency to focus on how these external factors are driving an evolving landscape and growing interest in deploying AI technologies. So over the last year, we have been seeing that landscape steadily evolving and AI is currently being used in a wide range of nuclear power operations, including what you heard today from, from Jim, from mining nuclear data for predictive maintenance to understanding core dynamics for more accurate reload planning. So we as an agency, we recognize the potential for using data science and AI in regulatory decision making. But at the end of the day, what we are interested in is understanding what are the possible regulatory implications of using AI within, uh, within a nuclear power plant. So at the end of the day, what we want to do is to ensure that these technologies are developed safely and securely. So we see uh, today that uh, this is an opportunity for us to start shaping the norms and the values to enable the responsible and ethical use of AI. So we as an agency, must, we must be prepared to evaluate these technologies. Uh, next slide, please. So we as an agency, we are anticipating that the industry will be deploying AI technologies that may require regulatory review and approval in the next five years and beyond. Uh, as such, we are proactively developing an AI artificial intelligence st strategic plan to better position the agency in AI decision making. So the plan currently has the goals for AI partnerships, like what you see here today, cultivating an AI proficient workforce, utilizing AI tools to enhance our NRC processes, but at the end of the day, to assure our readiness for AI decision making. So we want to use this plan as a tool to increase our regula uh, regulatory stability and certainty. And the plan will also facilitate communication to enable the staff to provide timely regulatory information to our internal and, and external stakeholders. So while we were developing the plan, we formed an interdisciplinary team of AI subject matter experts across the agency and to be able to increase the awareness of AI's technological adoption in the industry, we hosted uh, three public workshops in 2021 uh, that basically brought together the Nuclear 2 community to be able to discuss current and future state of AI. Uh, we also initiated uh, dialogues within the nuclear community and with our international counterparts, uh, gaining valuable insights and identifying potential areas of collaboration. One note, uh, one thing to know, like you heard from Ben, like the NRC is not alone when it comes to overseeing the safe and secure deployment of AI. The topics of explainability, trustworthiness, bias, robustness, ethics, uh, security, and risk are actually common for any entity that wants to deploy AI technologies in designing and operating a nuclear facility. So that's one of the reasons that we're made, uh, meeting with other government agencies, including the Department of Defense, to be able to identify new partnerships to leverage their expertise and experience of AI. Uh, lastly, we are committed in providing opportunities for the public to be able to participate in a meaningful way in our decision-making process. So 
As we continue developing uh, this plan, we plan to solicit comments uh, from the public and feedback from the advisory committee on reactor safeguards in the summer of 2022. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we do recognize the public interest in the potential regulatory implications of AI, and we want to provide opportunities for the public to be heard. Uh, that's one of the reasons that, that we are uh, uh, that, that we're trying to make uh, the principle of, of good regulation to be open and transparent in everything that we do, and to be able to ensure stakeholder engagement. We have developed this timeline shown in the slide of what are our current activities for the remainder of the year. So I do encourage everybody here to uh, participate and provide comments on our plan. Uh, our team is planning to host an AI workshop in the summer of 2022 to be able to remain aware of, of the fast pace of technological adoption of AI in the, in the industry, but as well as we want to communicate uh, with our external stakeholders about the NRC's progress on AI activities. Lastly, our plan is to issue the strategic plan by the fall of 2022. But I want to mention that early coordination, dialogue, and pre-planning are key for us to increase in our regulatory readiness and stability for the industry to be able to deploy these technologies. Uh, as you heard today from one of the commissioners, we don't want to become a barrier. We want to become an enabler for this technology For this technology, if the industry decides to move forward with that. Uh, so early engagement and information exchange is important for to supporting that stand knowledge to be able to have that timely deployment and the execution of the strategy. Uh, next slide, please. So in closing, here's our contact information. So if you want to reach out to us after the break, uh, that basically concludes our presentation. And I would like to now turn it over to Dr. Elaine so we can commence the Q&A session. So Dr. Elaine, back to you. All right, thank you, Luis. So we're now gonna move into the question and answer portion. You can continue to submit questions. So please do so as we chat this afternoon. So the first one, Luis, I'm gonna hand over to you. Mm -hmm. Are you finding any unique skills necessary in the area of AI and data analytics and how are you addressing skill needs? That's a really good question. I think data science works actually uh, is, is a unique skill set that the agency uh, really needs to have. But that field of science actually has several subdomains. As we, as we know, we have computer science, mathematics, and statistics. Uh, for data science skills, I think it's important for that person to know a lot about Python or Java, which are basically very com uh, commonly sought after. But one of the things that we're doing as an agency is developing this AI strategic plan. And one of the goals that we have is called cultivating an AI proficient workforce. And as part of that, what we're trying to do is to identify what is the pipeline of data science as staff to be able to evaluate an AI technology coming down the road and also to be able to develop uh, AI tools internally to be able to better uh, improve our processes. And as part of that, we develop a, a, a data science training qualification plan. And in the plan basically provides on the job training as well as some of the skill sets that we believe our staff needs to be able to evaluate these technologies. Great. Thank you, Luis. Jean, a question for you that came in. What happens to the reports that are not worth human review? Yeah, so the, the analytic will look at what, what are probable uh, failures or probable uh, outcomes that we're looking for, and it'll assign a confidence level, and then it'll allow the end user to make the call, if you will. For the ones that aren't shown, they're usually very low confidence, so they're not shown. Uh, however, as I mentioned, there's backstopped uh, processes that uh, still provide feedback, you know, uh, on, on, for example, if we would have misses. And, and what we've learned is that, um, uh, you know, the, it's important to have those backstop processes so that if you do have a miss and it's not shown to the end user in that process, you still get the opportunity to understand why you missed and then go correct the algorithm. And, and that's indeed what we've done on our first application with maintenance rule functional failures. And, and so far we've had zero misses 
uh, since we've done that. But uh, again, you'd rely on backstop processes to uh, to see those misses as they're called. Great, thank you. Okay, question for Ben. On your slide for Path to Assured AI, I'm interested in understanding a bit more about the VNV frameworks for AI ML. Any suggestions? Sure. Um, so I will say, of course, VNV, I think, of AI systems is always going to be fraught with challenges. Um, you know, especially when you're talking, uh, let's say, a machine learning deep neural network, understanding what each of those nodes can you know achieve what is being activated and how that impacts uh, your final result is going to be challenging. Um, but some of the things that we're, we're kind of looking at, and um, let's see here, I kind of jotted a few down. Uh, looking at you know uh, modeling and simulation, you know I think that's always going to be a factor in uh, the VNV of an AI system, uh, putting it into that simulated environment and trying to see how it reacts. Uh, concurrently with that, thinking about design and experiment thinking about uh, Monte Carlo simulations, uh, again, putting them through kind of that simulated environment to see how it reacts. Um, and I should clarify, this is not uh, necessarily just for image. You know, you could do images, you could do uh, classification, linear regression, decision-making, uh, decision trees even, you know, a lot of these different things through simulations of data inputs and mapping that to their outputs. Uh, where something we're looking at, you know, explainability of AI, not necessarily as a way to prove how something is working, uh, but also as a way to help validate what an AI system might be uh, trying to achieve or trying to decide or trying to, you know, that, that answer that it's trying to arrive at can give us some guidance as to how it's getting there. Uh, and I think the last thing I'll mention kind of is instrumentation of that AI, um, trying to you know, we may not know exactly why, let's say, a node has activated for a deep neural network, but maybe we can compare that to other nodes, or maybe we can kind of compare it to um, other similar systems that may not use AI to try to understand how those lower level functions are impacting, impacting that decision to give us that confidence during a uh, VNV assessment. Thank you, Ben. All right, next question for Aline. How is your organization identifying areas where AI or data analytic approaches are applicable and have the potential for the greatest positive impact? Um, well, that's uh, what I explained in my presentation. Uh, we uh, have um, a methodology based on uh, organizing te technical meeting. Well, we define uh, with uh, our member states a mandate, and then we deploy these methods. So um, the technical meeting we organized last year was uh, really uh, serving that purpose, uh, which was to provide international cross-cutting forum to discuss foster cooperation and artificial intelligence application methodologies, tools, and enabling infrastructure to have the potential to advance nuclear technology and, uh, and application. So it's quite a long title. Um, and so through this meeting, we uh, are able to understand state of art. Uh, we identify our role also in the acceleration uh, of uh, AI in the nuclear field. And, uh, we, and we have quite a large view fr from uh, R&D to uh, already uh, uh, technologies that are deployed. Um, and so we, it includes nuclear data, uh, nuclear fusion, nuclear physics, as I shown on, on the picture. So uh, nuclear power, security, radiation protection, and nuclear safeguards, because also I, I was more or less speaking uh, about nuclear power, but uh, AI applies also on all this uh, domain. And uh, this uh, uh, AI methodology can have very really, uh, positive impact uh, to improve modeling and simulation capabilities. So that's how we organize ourselves, yes. Thank you. And of course, and of course it's uh, uh, everything is uh, available uh, as public information. Wonderful, thank you. 
All right, Luis, the next question is for you. How old is the how will the strategic plans fit in with the NRC's hierarchy of documents? And what's next after the strategic plan is released? That's a good question. So we are looking at that right now. So the strategy will be an OREC report, uh, kind of similar of, of uh, the rest of the agency strategy documents. Uh, the strategy itself is not long, it's 15 pages. Uh, however, there's a companion document that we're developing that is called like an AI roadmap. And the AI roadmap has basically the what, how we're gonna, how we're gonna be doing this. And one of the things that we wanna do is to start uh, doing some research on, on an AI methodology to have a basis to, because the industry during the last workshop, they mentioned that they are interested in for the NRC to provide some type of a regulatory guide or guidance document. But in order for us to develop that guidance document, we need to have some type of a white paper or a technical basis that we can put into that regulatory guidance. So what we wanna do uh, after the AI strategy plan, we'll do some research, but at the same time, we wanna keep engaging the industry in what are their plans in potentially deploying, because in order for us to develop guidance, we need to have a better understanding of uh, where industry is planning to use this? Uh, uh, is industry interested in, in autonomous control? Is industry interested in using AI for safety systems? Depending on what we hear about those discussions, we'll, we'll start doing more research. Uh, and the idea is to, for us to be agile. We want to have that framework uh, available in the next five years. Louise. All right, next one for Jean. I'm gonna combine a couple questions here. So this is around uh, the CAP tool, if that's an off the shelf, and then how your data science team is set up and built around your capabilities. Yeah, so the, um, the tool we're using right now was developed by Jensen Hughes. Uh, Jensen Hughes is a company we've worked with for many years at Constellation. Uh, they've done a lot of our probabilistic risk assessment and models and they have great uh, capabilities in, in the area of AI and ML. Uh, and and uh, again, they, they started with this first application two years ago. So they had already developed an algorithm. They, they, they understood our interfaces with the IT systems and databases and servers. Uh, they had relationships with our IT people. So they were in essence, the perfect storm. So they've, they've developed this algorithm. They call it data advisor. And, uh, and uh, we're, we're now starting to look at other applications to use that, that particular technology. And, and, and we think this, this has real benefits because we already have contractual uh, uh, situations set up with them. They're very familiar with our programs and processes and procedures. They, uh, many of their engineers hold uh, Constellation uh, qualifications, technical qualifications. So. Uh, you know, we find that working with them is very uh, seamless and smooth. Um, on the on the second question, uh, you know, I think I think this sort of comes goes a, a long way towards answering that, right? That we're we're uh, you know, it would become expensive if you go outside and you go to various vendors, but we're finding by uh, utilizing them, working with our own IT people, it's it's been very uh, efficient uh, thus far. Um, but you know, these are small applications we've started with. We haven't really tried big yet. You know, if you read some of the literature, they they advise against uh, big moonshots, right? You know, take small steps, small bites of the elephant, uh, you know, look to uh, achieve adoption and, and confidence as you move into the bigger application. So for example, what Ben said, we, we don't have deep learning algorithms yet. Uh, those those would present you know bigger challenges for VNV and things like that. But uh, right now we're we're trying to stay small, get some wins, uh, and and build on that as we move forward. So I'll kind of stop there, Terry. I think if that answered the question. Great, thanks. So Ben, can you talk a little bit more about repeatability, especially in the context of AI and ML, and what is kind of in that uh, framework of what might be achievable? Sure. Um, so uh, from, from kind of my perspective, you know, repeatability is going to be paramount. Um, you know, we don't want to have a system, I think for anyone, for, for the DOD, for the NRC, uh, as, as one of their um, customers, you know, they don't want a system that they don't feel is going to be repeatable. 
in terms of its the way it operates. Uh, so we kind of are taking the idea that uh, whatever system is presented, it has to be repeatable and we have to be able to prove that to the best of our abilities. And one of the things I feel we can achieve with AI and ML systems is that if we are able to identify all of the inputs that a system is going to be receiving when it gets that decision, that will give us a good step towards meeting that repeatability. Um, we're, we're not gonna be, at least I don't believe we're going to be looking at uh, systems that are, are coming up with new, um, what should I call it? Uh, kind of new methods of completing tasks or um, looking at the way things are working on their own. You know, we, we kind of call it online learning, I think, uh, which I don't know if that's an official term, but you know, because that's where you do start to run into those issues of repeatability, you know, if something has been retrained or relearned. Uh, but if you have the ability for what I'll call a static AI ML system uh, to, to lock down that system and lock down that training and truly understand, and that's the key point, you know, truly understand the inputs to that system, I believe you can attain that repeatability. And I think we are going to have to get to that achievable state of repeatability. Uh, if not, then we have to start thinking uh, risk mitigations, risk assessments, and possibly bounding of system capabilities to make sure that if it's not going to repeat exactly the way it should, we have um, hard stops, we have the ability to bound the system so that if it doesn't go repeatable, it still stays in with that bound. Uh, so I would say the goal, you know, if you will, the objective is to have a re fully repeatable system, but the threshold is repeatable with um, some guidance and some bounding in the off chance that uh, we've encountered something that makes it no longer repeatable. Thank you. So Elaine, question for you. Does the international environment have unique challenges for AI development and use? Uh, yes, it's I say unique in the term of uh, yes, it, indeed. Um, there are many uh, AI uh, now um, in the industrial world, and we have to apply it in the nuclear industry. And we know that uh, there are a lot of conservatism uh, in our uh, in our world, uh, and uh, especially uh, linked with uh, uh, nuclear safety uh, that we shall ensure. So yes, it's a unique challenge, but I would say it's multiple uh, in its in uh, because AI covers a lot of uh, techniques and a lot of application, and I guess that some are easier to use than uh, others. And really, um, what is for me um, important to, to have is um, a kind of framework where even if step-by-step -step VNV is not possible, uh, we define the uh, conditions, the outer conditions uh, that are necessary to have um, a safe development of AI, meaning uh, what are the, uh, yes, the physical um, running the, the the model uh, in certain uh, way that we are sure that it does not exceed certain limits in, uh, in the result. And one part of uh, the challenge also is to have uh, uniform requirements uh, to feed the system because um, not everyone, but uh, AIs or, or at least uh, the uh, deep learning machine or these things that, that uh, well is um, uh, building itself when uh, running, uh, when feeding data, uh, all these systems, they, you cannot fit them with the same requirement. And what uh, uh, was said before is that, uh, yes, if, if we can have uh, something repeated, uh, repeated data and get, get the same results, it's true if you don't change uh, the, the system inside. But, uh, and so we also have to work to um, develop uh, uh, it's a kind of international uh, rec um, recognized standards on how to uh, settle the requirements, input data to the system so that uh, it can be repeatable, not only because we have the same data and the same system, but uh, because we have the same data and we want to have more or less the same results. 
I, I don't know if I am can be understood, but it's uh, so not, not only a question of VNV of the internal system, but it's also um, standardization for what is should be uh, the requirement in the input data, the format itself. Oh, great! Thank you. All right, so we've gotten a question that's for all the panelists, so we'll, we'll go around on this one. And it's your thoughts on cyber. So as we work in, in the area of AI, how do we know that the AI hasn't been cyber compromised? How do you in, basically build that trust with the AI knowing the cyber landscape? So I'm gonna start, Gene, with you. Yeah, it, when I saw the question, my, my first thought was that, you know, what where it's embedded and used is, is within internal systems that are already cyber uh, protected. So, uh, you know, this is not like it's external and separate from uh, any of the databases and, and uh, softwares that uh, Constellation already uses. So I would say we, we just rely on the existing cyber uh, protections. Okay. Um, ben, your thoughts? Sure. Um... I think I do agree with Gene. You know, a lot of uh, uh, cyber hardening is going to be dependent on the system. Uh, but I think something to keep in mind um, that we're looking at as well is uh, cybersecurity of your supply chain. Um, so, as an example, um, for an AI ML system, supply chain could be your data. So, not only about the security and cyber resiliency of your your development environment, but also your data. You know, has your data been compromised that's going to be used to train that system? Um, has there been an injection of bias or poisoning into that data stream that's going to be used during training? You know, uh, I would like to think that we have good cyber assessments and assurance, you know, again, to Gene on um, systems that are actively being used. Uh, but something that we want to start looking at is before use, you know, during development, is there enough cybersecurity on that development side to ensure that what we're getting at the end is still a cyber secure product. If I can add to that, uh, yep. that's one of the things that we are looking in an AI strategic plan that we're working with our answer folks to answer that question. Uh, it's a hard question to, for us to answer. I think the, the problem that we have right now is that industry starting to do this little by little, integrating this into plan operations. And the question now becomes, okay, how is that system not gonna be used for plan operations? Is the system not gonna be doing a lot of the decision-making? How is that data being used and transmitted to the outside? Uh, that's kind of the questions that we're asking and what will be the regulatory implications upon that? And that's one of the first things that we have to start thinking about. And I know when we met with ACRS uh, back in the summer, they were concerned about this question as well. So it's a hard question to answer at this point, but that's part of what we're developing the air strategic plan to be able to tackle that. Yeah, Terry, if I can add to what Luis said, uh, you know, we're, we're not even remotely thinking about, you know, operating systems at the plant or equipment with AI and ML. Now that might be down the road and in the future, but I would call that one of those moonshots that, you know, you're advised not to go after too quickly, you know, you start small. So, I mean, right now we're looking at processes and portions of processes and tasks. And, and as, as one of our folks put it uh, actually to me yesterday, you know, we're, this, we're using as it a decision support tool, right? Not a decision making tool. So, you know, it's, it's still something that the human has override capabilities understands completely from an explainability perspective where the results came from. So, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not at the fully autonomous stage by any stretch yet. So I, I think, you know, uh, you're not going to see that for a while until you first get confidence in the smaller projects. Mm, and uh, yes, if, if I may add something, yes. Uh, the, that's why we have technology for development and technology for deployment and the technology for deployment, as, as Jane said, uh, are helping and supporting uh, decisions, but they don't, we don't decide, or well, the machine don't decide uh, for, for ourselves. Um, and uh, I also think that we need to have, uh, yes, to define limits, uh, acceptable limits for the performance of the system. And, and if uh, the result is out of the limits, uh, then we go back to manual process. 
that's uh, also a way to 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 do and even uh, and of of course applying all the cyber security uh, methods that are already uh, known as uh, data management and uh, protection against uh, uh, attacks and so on. But really, uh, we are not yet in a mode where we can uh, be uh, fully uh, automated. Right, thank you. So, Jean, over to you. How do you see AI and data analytics providing a positive safety benefit for nuclear power plants? Well, uh, and, and that's a common question that we get. And I, I would just say simply stated, uh, this is a, a golden opportunity for us to first eliminate low value work and, and second, better focus on what's important or, or significant. So, uh, you know, it's, 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 that's really it in a nutshell. Um, you know, when it, when it comes to the cap screening and prioritization, uh, you know, you want to focus on those more significant conditions, right? And this enables us to quickly do that and spend that time, you know, to understand those completely, uh, you know, while not completely ignoring the lower significant stuff. Uh, and, and in the area of work screening and work management and work requests, you know, we're able to look at the more higher priority equipment failures and, and quickly understand, you know, how to code those, how to get them uh, uh, properly uh, sequenced out to the work groups, start to order parts. I mean, the sooner you fix things like that, the better and safer your plan is. So, you know, in a nutshell, it's really just enabling us to better focus on what's really important. I think that's the big benefit to safety right now. All right, thank you. Luis, you got a question about the thoughts of how autonomous systems may be used at decommissioning of nuclear power plants. That's a good question. Uh, I think the person is asking more about, uh, I'm inferring, it's more about the use of drones for inspections. At the end of the day, like, uh, uh, we shouldn't be a barrier if industry wants to use that uh, as, as for doing some inspections. I think it, it boils down to what is the level of autonomy of that system being used in the commissioning. Is the system used more for improving operational performance? That doesn't have a lot in access to, to safety. So I don't see we as a regulator will have that impact. But now, if that is impacting a safety system and, and autonomy is involved, okay, uh, like what Ben mentioned, can we have that assured trust of that uh, of that system to be able to, to do what is intended? That's where the regulatory implication will come in. Uh, and that, uh, but at the end of the day, the NSA should not be a barrier, should be an enabler if industry wants to do that. But we need to have trusted assurance that if they want to pursue that, that we know how that system is actually, uh, we need to have a better understanding of how the system was trained. Can we trust this system to be fully autonomous? Or, should, or what, what is, where is human in the loop in, in, this, in this case? So that's the things that we need to consider if industry wants to go there. I don't know if anybody else from the panel wants to comment about that. Yeah, definitely to, to send that home, hopefully. Um, yeah, that's something we definitely have to consider with any of the systems that we develop. You know, how is the human integrated into that system and how is that oversight maintained? Uh, because we need to ensure that trust of the system. We need to ensure that uh, that use of that system, you know, it's still meeting the intent of its design. Uh, and I think that's going to be very critical uh, moving forward for sure. This one's for all the panelists. So we've been talking about the AI at this stage of use is a lot more for a decision tool, helping we get the data. So the question that came in, some of the questions that come in are along the theme of when could the algorithm if, advance to a point where it could change its code on its own. So a model that would learn and further develop and how would we go about moving into that area where the AI may be different from what it was originally programmed or coded for? Um, I'll go ahead and start with uh, Gene on thoughts of. Yeah, you know, when I talk to our experts, I'm, and I'm not a data analyst, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I know a lot of them now. And uh, 
uh, you know, we're, we're far away from using deep learning, I think, right now. Uh, and deep learning, of course, would be where it's almost fully autonomous and it's learning on its own and it's getting smarter and it's, it's doing things that uh, on its own, including perhaps changing its code. And I think Ben mentioned that earlier that, you know, that creates unique challenges for, you know, verification and validation. Um, so, I, I mean, speaking for what we're doing right now, I, I think we're still far away from being there. Uh, do I think we can get there? I think we can. Uh, you know, my reading tells me that the smart people say, you know, start slow, start small, uh, you know, build for adoption and credibility, you know, don't build for the big hits and the big solves uh, and, and, you know, gain confidence and build on that as you move. So I, I think we, we still need to, uh, you know, build on the smaller projects before we tackle those, those types of challenges, Terry. Aline, what are your thoughts? <laughs> well, it's um, uh, I, that's what yes, that's what you call deep learning. I guess that all these systems will be of use as support systems. For example, uh, when we um, do predictive analysis uh, among a lot of data, so uh, of course we can not of course, but. Uh, we can have machine learning and deep learning by uh, uh, feeding existing data and uh, trying to predict what's going on. But it will be used as a, an additional uh, support system for the operator, for example, or for the designer or for whoever. But we don't see it really as a direct uh, application, at least for the time being, because uh, we need to uh, understand what's going on in the uh, in the AI system. Um, what I wanted also to point out, even in a normal uh, safety uh, INC system, there is a request when developing the system to have independent verification and validation. So even if uh, there won't be uh, the traditional VNV method for this uh, AI system, I suppose that there will be uh, the, the, the regulator, but it's not for me to, to answer, but to the specialist, that there will be kind of independent uh, uh, verification and validation system uh, imposed by the regulator when we go to really uh, safety systems. So that's also another um, uh, way to control, or not to control, but to have more trust in, uh, in what's being, uh, um, what's coming out of uh, AI systems. Yeah, and I think what uh, I think you hit the nail. Trustworthiness comes to my mind. Uh, how can we ensure? How can we trust that uh, that AI tool? Because at the end of the day, what we care about the agency is: can we understand how that AI made that decision? What were the factors that were included in order to to make that decision to operate as as intended in compliance with the regulation? That I think that's what that that we need to be caring about. If that ever happens. I don't think that's going to happen in the near term, but that's something that is always on the back of our mind that if industry wants to deploy this kind of technologies into the field, like uh, we need to be asking kind of these questions about explainable AI, trustworthiness AI, ethical AI, and even the data, uh, some of the bias that will be included, like Ben mentioned, uh, that also has some implications at the, at the back end on the testing and evaluation. So, it, hopefully we, we're not gonna go there, but it's, it, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't go there. Yeah, Terry, if, if I may add, um, uh, we, you know, in, in the nuclear industry, uh, we have plenty of processes, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, that we can look to, to apply this technology. And, and uh, you know, I, I think, you know, the solution that comes to mind when I hear the other speakers talk is a very well, de well defined, design user interface, right? When you have a really well-defined user interface, uh, it, it's, it's explainable and, and the end users understand how you're getting that decision. And, you know, to answer one of the questions earlier with Ben, we, we use a multi-metric uh, uh, method, you know, where there's four or five different things that combine to give us a confidence level on this is a potential, you know, failure, or this is a potential 3B, you know, condition report. So uh, I think having a really well-defined user interface uh, goes a long way towards achieving, you know, what we're talking about here. But, but there's plenty of processes in our business that I think we can, 
we can turn to and start to try to apply this technology. Uh, you know, one idea, for example, would be uh, causal analysis, right? Uh, we, we have plants and equipment fails. And uh, what do we do? We, we scramble our resources and go into DEF CON 2 and decide, you know, how, why did it fail? You know, support refute matrices, failure modes and effects. And, and, you know, this technology could help us to quickly establish causal because, you know, that data is out there just waiting to be interrogated. So I think there's plenty of processes in our business that we can apply this to without having to worry about being, you know, fully autonomous and, and help support the decision-making process. So just some added thoughts there. And I just wanted to, to speak for one second I, on, on part of that original question as well, um, concerning, you know, uh, what I kind of called online learning. I do think that's something that's going to be far off. You know, I can't predict the future necessarily, but if we want to still achieve uh, that safety assurance, that repeatability, um, those different aspects that are important to all of us, I think, here on the call, it's, it's going to be a while. You know, we need to build that trust and we need to build that capability to have that confidence in that system from, from safety, from VNB, from reliability, you know, all of those, those illities, as they say. And I think that's going to be very difficult when you start thinking systems that can adjust themselves um, moving forward. Great points. Thank you, panel. Next question that came in, um, I'm going to start with Luis and then go over to Ben. So as you both were talking about your teams and working on um, the AI initiatives, question came in asking if uh, social scientists are included on your teams. That's a really good question. At the moment, our core AI team does not include social scientists, but that doesn't mean that we're talking to uh, social scientists across the agency, for example, one of the areas that we're talking about is on the area of human factors. So uh, they're currently looking at the, at the strategy right now, they're providing comments, but as part of the core team, we didn't have that, but eventually we need to have some uh, some person from, from that field into the team. Sure, and from uh, from my perspective, we have uh, human system integration experts um, that are a part of our teams. Uh, we also have ethicists that can be part of the team. Uh, we have um, uh, legal authorities that can review different things. Um, so we try to make sure that we continue to have kind of that broad um, review of those systems, AI or not, you know, even for non-AI ML systems, we try to ensure that we have as part of that um, until a release process that I showed earlier, that those reviews are still taking place regardless. Um, so we'll just work to uh, adjust them or, or integrate new aspects uh, for AI and ML technologies. And that's definitely something that we're looking at right now, uh, identifying those gaps and uh, looking for ways to fill them. Thank you. So we've gotten several questions around data. So I want to steer this one to the panel from your different perspectives. So of course, an AI that's built off of data models are only good as kind of the data they're based on. So how do we go about developing in your thoughts on those data sets for the AIs that we see that may be used in our respective organizations? Aline, can I start with you? Well, the data sets, uh, as I said, well, we participate in uh, standard uh, standardization for that. So there is uh, work uh, ongoing uh, in the IEC. I guess that there are other regulatory, uh, or, or at least standard standardization bodies that are uh, working on that. Um, because, uh, as I said, uh, well, AI systems develop quite fast. There are um, number, numerous of startups, and uh, we cannot adapt uh, all the data to uh, the different systems which are available. And of course, it's, well, standardization comes um, a little bit later than uh, what's available on the market, but it's really necessary. And yeah, we, we participate in this uh, in this field. It's an important. Uh, uh, part of the development that we follow in the AEA.
Terry, you're muted. <laughs> Almost made it through without doing that. Uh, Luis, your thoughts? Yeah, I think data quality is really important, both in the data that you train the model and, and also the data uh, that goes after that. I think for us as an agency, the question that comes to my mind is, are we gonna be requiring data for the licensees in some of these submittals? My gut feeling is no, uh, but that's what some of the things that we need to consider in, in evaluating some of these technologies. The other thing that comes to my mind for internal purposes, we uh, before we go to the data, we, we need to better uh, step back and what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Like, uh, do we have, uh, what is the process will benefit the most of using AI? If that's the case, do we have the right data? Is the data on structure? Is the data already structured? Uh, so these are the kind of the questions that we're going to be looking moving forward in, because as you can, as you know, Adams, it has a huge repository information, but the data is not structured. What, uh, how can we structure that data that it can become machine learning ready for not only for NRC staff, but also for the industry and members of the public to be able to, to use that data. Right. Uh, ben, any thoughts? Yes, many thoughts. <laughs> uh, data quality, I mean, it's just, that's so important, in my opinion at least, it's so important and also so challenging. Um, you know, AI, while it's been around, I, I guess I'll say around for a while, um, I don't think everyone really realized that the data that you have for your AI system might not be to the quality that you need it to be. You know, we've been collecting data, I think, in industry and everywhere for a very long time, but does that data have all the metadata? Does it have all the features? Does it have all that extra information that you really need to create a quality AI system? So you might claim that you have big data, you know, you have all this information, but is it the right data? Is it unbiased? Does it have the right amount of um, context, the right amount of diversity within it of, of environments, let's say? Um, so I think kind of assessing that is gonna be one of the first big challenges when you're thinking data quality um, and, and something we're looking at is, is developing uh, like a data, data safety management plan or some sort of data, I don't want to use the word certification, but some sort of uh, maybe I'll say data assessment to understand the, the quote again, illities of your data to make sure that is it appropriate? You know, is it the right data? Do you actually have enough of that data and to a high enough quality to make it usable? Uh, and I, I'm concerned that may be a challenge for, for a lot of different organizations when you really start to look at the depth and breadth of your data. Uh, but, you know, that, that's kind of my thought, but I, I think a lot of people kind of feel the same way and, and we'll just, we'll see what their data looks like. Great. Gene, any quick thoughts? I know we're starting to run out of time. Yeah, actually a million, like Ben said, <laughs> um, you know, this is why we pick cap data, right? Cap data is a good source because it's big data. We, we've got a big fleet, so we've got 12 plants we can draw upon, right? And, and uh, you know, we recently gave 600,000 records of data back to DOE for them to do research and play with. And, and uh, uh, so, you know, uh, I, I think that's a good data source in the sense that it's a structured one. You know, it, it operates by rules, there's procedures, so it's not unstructured and it's not all over the place. Now that said, uh, I think you'd be fooling yourself if you thought it was consistent from plant to plant to plant. And so I, I think one of the real values of what we're doing is we're gonna improve data quality because we're gonna achieve a level of consistency now with the algorithm that perhaps we didn't have before because you know each station, each plant's different, different cultures, different performance, different people. So I, I think we're gonna improve data quality and, uh, and I think cap data is the perfect storm to go, to go uh, you know, use these techniques on. Uh, I think it screams for these AI ML techniques, frankly. Great. Thank you. What a great session. Uh, you know, AI for today is definitely a multifaceted area. Lots of things to look into as, as we move forward. Um, if we could get the contact slide on the screen. Um, I wanna thank our panelists our session coordinators, Matt, Dennis, and Trey Hathaway, all the support uh, from the RIC team for this session and the research AI team for keeping tabs on this dynamic area. And thank you to all of you who participated today. The presentations are available on the RIC website under the program agenda for this session, and they'll be in the RIC uh, agency's document repository following the RIC event. Um, 
I've been pleased to be your session chair today. Um, and then you've got my contact information. And with that, I will close the session. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.